So here we go. Take a few notes. Get out your notes. Very first thing, section 1.2 says, which are functions? Now you have had this before, so even without Mrs. Ford saying a word, you should be able to tell me which of these are functions. Who remembers how you tell if a picture is a function? Moses? Right there. That is the back side. No, no, no. The back of the front page. Right there. 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 Right you're going to tell me if they are functions or not. Do you know how to do that, Moses? No, although you're kind of close. It's how many times something crosses, but it's not the x-axis. Jake? Uh, you use like the vertical line test. You use the vertical line test. The VLT, the vertical line test. Remember, look at that first picture. Okay. Draw, you don't have to draw them. Think about drawing them or actually draw them or lay your pencil down like this. Notice that every vertical line crosses in how many places? One. As long as it only crosses in one, it's a function. When you look at the second picture, what happens when I draw that vertical line? it crosses twice. So this one is a yes, this one is a no, not a function. Because when you draw a vertical line, it can only cross one time. So, how about C? Yes, it passes the vertical line test. How about D? No. E, yes. F, no. And the question we are answering when we say yes or no is, is it a function? And we give the answer, yes or no, based on whether the vertical line crosses more than once. Everybody got it? So if I wait five minutes and give a quiz over that, everybody's got it. The main topic of today's conversation is the notion of domain. Does anybody remember that word? And can anybody tell me what it is? Julia? Savannah? Isn't the domain the x? It's the set of all the first coordinates. That's right, it's the x's. So we're, looking, we're talking about the set of x values. Okay? So for example, if I just made up a set of ordered pairs, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, there's a set of ordered pairs. And I said, what's the domain? You would say the domain is the numbers one, three, five, and seven. Right? Now, in terms of equations, which is what number one is, That's a little tougher. As long as I list the points for you, it's not a problem. But what in the heck do you do with an equation when you have to tell what the domain is? Listen carefully. I have rules for you, and they are very simple. The domain is impacted, except for some rare, weird situations. The domain is impacted by two things. The if, it ha if there's a fraction, the denominator cannot be zero. So I call these red flags, domain red flags. Denominator cannot be zero. So when you look at your problem, the first question you 
ask yourself is, is there a denominator? And the answer is no. Good, we don't have to worry about that one. The second one is, anything under the radical, anything under a radical must be greater than or equal to zero. In other words, I don't want any negative stuff under here. Does that make sense to you? What happens when we put negative stuff under here? We get eyes. We, get eyes. we don't want eyes. We want to keep it real. No imagining. <coughs> So does this one have a radical? All right, boys and girls, I just told you there are two red flags, denominators and radicals. If you don't have either one, your domain is the set of real numbers. That is the symbol for the set of real numbers. So you could write all reals. Why is your phone talking to you? That's my iPad. Sorry. Oh. Well, turn, make, t shut her up. All right. <laughs> my bad. Okay. So we got a set of real numbers as our domain because we do not have what? What do we not have? A fraction or a radical. No fraction, no radical, no issues. Okay, so now we look at problem B. Looking at B. Oh shoot. What do we have in problem B? We have a radical. Now we do not have a fraction, so we don't have to worry about rule number one. But we do have a radical. So what's the rule for a radical? Anything under it has to be bigger than or equal to zero. If I know the rule, then this is easy. Whatever is under has to be bigger than or equal to zero, which means what about x? x has to be bigger than or equal to, well, well solve this, negative, <laughs> negative 5. That's your domain. Now, how did I know my domain? Was everything bigger than or equal to negative 5? Because I have a rule that tells me anything under the radical has to be bigger than or equal to 0. got a fraction. Okay, we got a rule for fractions. Fractions are problems. We have a rule for fractions. What's the rule for fractions say? Whatever's in the denominator cannot be zero. Which means what? X cannot be negative 5. There's your domain. That's your answer. X cannot be negative 5. Which means X could be anything else. So your X values are everything you could possibly dream of except negative 5. Alright, D. Now I'm going to erase my rules now because you've got them written down. You know what they are. So look at problem D. Do you have a radical? No. So we don't have to worry about that rule. But we do have a fraction, right? So what's our fraction rule? Savannah? Well, yeah, let's, let's go back to the beginning. That's ultimately what's going to happen. Yes, but let's go back to the beginning. The rule says whatever is in the denominator cannot be equal to zero. Now, Savannah, you can skip that step. If you just want to go ahead and go to the answer, that's fine. But this is, this is the foundation right here. Whatever is in the denominator cannot equal zero. 
So I'll add one and divide by four. So what's my domain? X cannot equal one fourth. Tonight. I won't. Someone might get by you. Aren't you a tackler or a defensive person? Yes. All right. Radical? Nope. Don't need to worry about it, but we do have a denominator, right? So, what's our rule for denominator? Denominator cannot equal zero. Wait a minute, this is a trick problem. Anybody getting bothered? Yeah. What are you bothered about? I'm going to take the square root. But what's the problem with taking the square root here? Yeah. Well, wait a minute. Let's go back. This is a weird problem. Let's go back and look. The rule says this cannot be zero. Tell me about 3x squared plus 1. 3x squared is a positive number, isn't it? What happens when you take a positive number and add 1? Will you ever get zero? No. This domain, all real numbers. There is no way that denominator could be zero. Can't be because of the way it's set up. When you tried to find the number that would make it zero, look what happened. You got an imaginary, right? It's a trick problem. That's a problem for the A students. Hopefully you all got it for all the A students. F. This is not a trick problem. Which part of the fraction am I interested in always? The denominator. I don't care about the numerator. It's irrelevant. Where domain is concerned, I want denominators and radicals. That's all I have to pay attention to. No radical, but the denominator cannot be zero, which means what's my domain? X cannot be zero. Just a few more, and we'll look at a homework question. What do you think, Brokaw? My denominator cannot be zero. What do I do with that, Zach Bond? Any ideas? You add the nine to the other side. I sure can. And then what? Square root. And when I square root, it's just like when I completed the square, Zach. What do I need to remember right here? Plus or minus. I do. So x cannot be, remember, this is cannot be. X cannot be plus or minus 3. So this time there are two things X can't be. 3 or negative 3. Does that make sense to you in terms of the original problem? Oh my goodness, look at H. When I do... Oh, when I do a domain problem, Taylor McDowell, when I do a domain problem, what do I look at? What do I have to pay attention to? Two things. What am I on the lookout for? A radical and a denominator. And oh my goodness, this problem has both. Okay, one at a time. 
What does the radical rule say? Whatever is underneath it must be greater than or equal to zero. So if I solve this, x has to be greater than or equal to <coughs> negative 5. Ms. McCormick, you on track here? That makes sense to you? Olivia, what's the second rule? The first rule says look out for those radicals. Okay, we've taken care of that. What's the second rule say? So whatever is in the denominator cannot be equal to zero. Which means, Brittany, what about x? If x minus 2 cannot be 0, then x cannot be 2. So in the answer blank, you've got to write two things, kids. You've got to say x has to be bigger than or equal to negative 5, and x cannot equal 2. And we have two things to do there because our problem had a radical and a denominator in it. The next one is tricky, but not super tricky. Frank, what's the rule for radicals? Whatever's under it, so 2 minus x has to be greater than or equal to 0. So if you solve it this way, you subtract 2 from both sides. Now what do I have to do? Split the start. I got to divide by negative 1, Moses, and you're right. When I do that, it becomes x is less than or equal to 2. Remember that rule? If you divide or multiply in an inequality, you have to change the symbol, switch the symbol. Google, you with me? And finally, one more of these. We've done a ton of them. No denominator, right, Katie? So we don't need to worry about that. Oh, what's the rule for radicals? Whatever, oh, well, be careful, radicals. Whatever is underneath must be greater than or equal to. In the radical, whatever's underneath the radical has to be greater than or equal to zero. So I'll subtract one and divide by three. That's your answer. Is it just not a function if it, if it is less than zero? Um, well, it's just undefined at that point. We are interested in what makes the output. Functions are input-output machines, so if you put a one in, you'll get an answer that, that comes out. We want the answer that comes out to be real. And if you put a negative in here, it's going to come out imaginary, and you don't want that. Okay, got it? All right, let's take out a half sheet of paper, please. Share with your partner there. Put your notes away. We're going to see if you really have it. yourself and then check with your neighbor. So see how much you can do by yourself. Okay, three questions. Here's number one. 
function. The question is, is it a function? So that's a yes or a no, but then I'm, gonna, I'm asking you why. So no guessing here. You either know why or you don't. You're going to tell me why or why not. So if you say yes, why? If you say no, why not? Find the domain for these two functions. This is not open note. Do this from your, what we just talked about. Do it yourself, then compare your answers with your neighbor. Make sure you got it explained if you have a question. But it's going to be in some days 60 minute chunks, some day 30 minute chunks, sometimes 70 minute chunks. So I have posted the week's assignments on Schoology. You might want to just write down the whole week's assignments and then know that by the end of the week, or let's say by next Monday, a week from Monday, all that has to be done. So it won't necessarily be that everything that's posted on Monday, we get through. Because if we only have a 30 minute period on Monday, we're not gonna get through it all. But then the next day we might have a 70 minute period and we'll get caught up. So you need to be working through it as we are. Do you understand what I mean? The assignments are posted in regular class period chunks, but that isn't how we're gonna go through it next week. 
So you just know by a week from Monday, all that has to be done. Do not wait. It's a week's worth of work, you guys. Don't wait till the next weekend to do it. Be doing it each day so that you can ask questions if you have them as we go along. Big stuff to look next week, too. So, all right, so who had a question about last night's homework, though? That was just a normal assignment. Who had a question about one of those? That's one of those sections. Yep. Ashley, is your hand up? Which one? Hi. 18 and 21. All right, let's look at 18. Um, okay. Alright, it, it, it refers back to number 15. So let's look at number 15, even though I didn't assign it. It says, model the data algebraically with a linear equation of the form y equals mx plus b. Write one equation for the women's data and another equation for the men's data. Now, yesterday, we talked about, I can't remember if it was women or men that we talked about, but we talked about one of them and then I assigned the other one. Let's look at just the women. What's happening to the women as, you go th as they go through year after year after year after year, the percentage of women is increasing. So if I drew a line to show that, and I'm not plotting the exact points and all that stuff, but the line would look something like this. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Okay, and then the men would be going the other way. Now the question is, explain why this isn't a perfect model. This kind of shows what's going on, but it's not perfect. Because what does this line keep doing forever and ever and ever? Increasing, increasing, increasing. These are percentages. Can percentages just keep going. Remember, here, maybe 70% are working. Here, 80% are working. 90% are working. 100% are working. Wait a minute. If that's 100% of the people working, doesn't my line have to stop there? No. Because I can't have 110% working. I have 100% and that's all I have. So the linear model isn't perfect because it implies you can keep going forever and in reality there's a stopping point. And the same with the men. The men's would be going down, but you can't keep going down forever because when you get to zero, you're done. You can't have negative 18% men. It's zero and you're done. So that's what that problem means. Okay. The, the, um, as much as we want the math to be perfect, it can't be perfect, but it does the best it can to describe the situation. Okay, what was the other one? 21. Okay, a garden shop sells 12 by 12. And 13 inch round. Okay, so this is kind of like what they looked at yesterday. So I can go in and buy 12 by 12, or I can buy 13 inch rounds. All right? Now, if they're... Are they selling them for the same price? And they're the same thickness, so I don't need to worry about that. I obviously want to buy, if I have a big ground to cover and a lot of space I want to cover, I need a lot oh, of these wait. things. Oh, no, I know how to do this. What do you do? With the square, you do length times width times mm -hmm. height. Well, except we don't even need the height part because they're the same thickness. We don't need to worry about that. So we're just going to find the area of the square, and it's 144 square inches. Yeah. So one square would cover this much territory in my yard. Now this is a circle. How do I find the area of the circle? Something with the pi. Right. Start with pi. R squared. That's it, pi r squared. So pi r squared, oops, I need r. This is the diameter. What's the radius going to be? 6.5. So I'll have pi times 6.5 squared. Remember when you put that in your calculator, remember we are squaring just the 6.5. So that area is 132. 
1.7 square inches. So if I don't care what it looks like, I don't care if they fit together or not, I just want to cover the most ground I can for the least amount of money, I'm going with my squares. All right, anybody else have a question about one of the homework problems? Yeah, Brandon. 29 is an equation. that we are solving. So what was your thought, Franny? So, uh, I think that's a great idea. <coughs> and did you add the 5 to? Yeah. is this, Franny? Starts with Q. Quadratic. It's a quadratic <laughs> equation. Right? And if I don't know what else to do with a quadratic equation, I'm never going to get stuck on a quadratic equation because what can I always do? The quadratic formula. Now, in order to do the formula, I need to know what my A, B, and C are. So for you, do not be confused. Remember, this is the normal format. So what's my A? What's my B? Zero. And my C is negative 13. So we'll have negative B plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Hmm. I don't know, is that 156? Is it? And I'm sure 156 breaks down. It's not a perfect square, but I'm sure it breaks down into something. 4 times 39, which is 3 times 13, and 2 times 2. So I have 2 root 39 over 6, which is root 39 over a bunch of arithmetic there for me, but once you got your quadratic figured out, you're on your way to the answer. Did anybody think about doing that problem a different way? Now, I want to just say one more time. If it's a squared equation, this will work every time. So if you don't know what else to do, do this. Harry, what else might we have tried? Um, I, I might have been wrong, but I did, uh, I just did 3 root the second equals 13 and then solved that out. And when you say solved it out, what do you like, mean? I, got, uh, I divided it by 3, and I got b the second equals 13 over 3. Bingo. Yep. That is another way to do the problem. So, Franny, because there's no B term, we could have just gotten the V squared by itself and then square rooted both sides. Now, the answers are supposed to be the same. That doesn't quite look like this. But remember, this is root 13 over root 3. And if you rationalize it so that you don't have your radical in the bottom, do you see how you'll end up with this very same thing? Yeah. That certainly would have been a little shorter, but it doesn't matter. Jordan? 13? 32. 32? That sounds like 13. 32. This is another quadratic equation, Jordan. And so what kind of bothers you about it? I know what bothers me about it. I know what I'm going to say. How did you do it? I did it for the quadratic formula. The quadratic formula? 
And did you just leave it like that and do the quadratic formula? Okay. If you're going to do the quadratic formula, my suggestion is, not a hard, fast rule, but what if we times everything by 4? Then we wouldn't have to worry about the fraction. Because what happened to you is, 